Hello everyone, my name is Mike Nichols and I will be giving a presentation on the health risks of the American veteran. Uh, this will take place on April 8th. Obviously, if you're listening to this, this is just for your benefit since you can't be here, whether you're the professor, or one of my classmates, this is just the general presentation that I'll be giving uh, on the 8th. I don't know exactly how many veterans will be there. I've been told anywhere from about three plus, maybe three to five if I'm lucky. Um, they're gonna be between the ages of about 45 to 60, all men. You may think this is a little bit older, um, but the average veteran is a male who is about 58 years old. So this is actually a prime target audience for most of the um, risks that do affect the American veteran. Again, it's not a perfect population, but it is a good group where, that a lot of this stuff will pertain to or may have pertained to throughout their lives. So without any further ado, uh, let's just dive right in. Now, this presentation is going to be not just a presentation, but also a small group discussion. So we're gonna go through the presentation, which has its own agenda of the three main health risks that affect veterans generally. Now there's a lot of different types of veterans out there that come with their a whole slew of comorbidities and issues. And we could go down the rabbit hole for days just talking about that and how they affect veterans specifically. But the big three that really kind of are the most hard hitting and cause the most damage uh, from a health condition standpoint are tobacco, suicide, and obesity. Um, so we're going to talk about these three. We're going to talk about how they present, how they affect veterans specifically, and why they're overrepresented in the veteran population. We're also going to uh, talk about some objectives. So we do have some goals for this presentation. This isn't just me uh, espousing information. There is actually a purpose, and we're going to go over some goals that we have and what we're going to do once this presentation is over. Then we're going to talk about some strategies for really preventing and combating these three main issues. And not only just strategies that work um, from peer-reviewed medical research, but also programs that the VA itself offers at almost all VA locations around the country. And then finally, since we are in, of course, Seminole and Western St. Pete, we're going to be talking about Bay Pines VA specifically and who you can call to get in touch with someone who really manages these programs. Once we're done with that, we're going to have a little bit of a small group discussion, maybe three or four questions that we're just going to talk about what we learned, how does this apply to our lives, and some steps we can take going forward. So that is our agenda for today. Now, the first main issue that affects veterans is tobacco use. Uh, I guess I should tell this to you about myself. I am a veteran. I was in the Marines for about five years. Um, served as an officer. It's really not important, but I did see a lot of guys and gals of all different shapes and sizes. And I can tell you that veteran tobacco use is rampant. So one third of veterans uh, regularly report using tobacco products. Uh, dip is quite popular, especially on field exercises. Um, also, when you compare this to only 17% of the non-veteran population that smokes, that's quite concerning because it's almost double the population in general that is going to be affected by the disease that uh, excessive tobacco use causes. Now, since a lot of veterans go to the VA, they are essentially getting public health uh, funding. So this, according to CDC, this means that $2.7 billion per year um, is spent on health issues, veteran health issues specifically, that uh, could be attributed to smoking. Now, you may not think this is a lot, but that's 7.8 of the VA budget. And when you work for a government organization, budgets are your lifeline. And if you're throwing away almost 10% of your budget on stuff that could be prevented, people tend to take notice and it's quite a public health cost as well as a detriment to the people who are addicted to tobacco. Now, the long-term effects of tobacco are quite debilitating. Um, if you are a smoker and a dedicated smoker, statistically speaking, if you do that for over a long period of time, you can decrease your lifespan by about 13 to 14 years when compared to people who don't smoke. So that is a huge, huge detriment uh, to yourself and also to um, just your quality of life because you can get lung cancer, uh, which is probably the most famous uh, symptom of chronic tobacco use. Um, also coronary artery disease, asthma, COPD, and cancer of not just the lungs, but the mouth if you tend to dip a lot. And this can spread and or metastasize, if you will, to the breast, the kidneys, uh, the prostate, and also the pancreas as well. So everyone has their own little theories about why tobacco use is so prevalent. Um, a lot of veterans, they tend to come from poor neighborhoods where smoking is more prevalent, but I've also seen personally that it is part of the culture. And when it's a kind of a cultural institution that doesn't really fit with, 
I guess, mainstream American society, there are certain things that tend to hang on um, about the military subculture. So, I mean, smoking, even though it is no longer 1960, it is still alive and well. And not just smoking, but vape, uh, dip, cigars. It is, I mean, there are Marine Corps traditions I've been a part of where smoking cigars was, it wasn't mandatory, but it was a part of the ceremony and you got a free cigar you got to partake in. So it is definitely a part of the culture. And it's no surprise that veterans are so prone to tobacco use and smoke more than the average population. So now we're going to talk about veteran suicide, and it is a touchy subject, but it's also one that is rampant among veterans in general. Um, the numbers that are quite often cited uh, are 18 to 22 veterans a day. And that is known not just by veterans themselves, a personal antidote story here. I actually had the privilege to deploy to the Middle East uh, pretty much at the time that ISIS, uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the terrorist organization was pretty much at the height of its power and they controlled a sizable, you know, piece of territory, most of Iraq, really. And at that time, they were really into propaganda videos. And so this was something that they would send out. They would make professional, high quality, high quality Hollywood style movies, um, just five minute long propaganda pieces. And they would cite the fact that American veterans are weak because they commit suicide at such high rates. So it is a touchy subject. No one likes to talk about it. Um, you have to present this image of being confident and being in control. And then to have the reality of 18 to 22 people committing suicide every day, that, that's quite a shock. So to put this in terms, I mean, if you just totaled up the amount of veteran suicide since 2005, you'd have 78,000. And to put that in perspective, that, I mean, Vietnam era, the war in Vietnam claimed 58,000 casualties, American, American dead. I should, well, there weren't casualties, they were um, you know, killed in action. So when you have that high of a number just being killed by enemy forces and you have you know, well over that, 120% essentially, you know, 20,000 more than what you lost in Vietnam being taking their own lives, it's quite an issue. And then, of course, suicide, it's a mental health issue and it's linked with a bevy of other conditions such as depression and all sorts of mental health illnesses from schizophrenia down to bipolarism. Now, the risk for suicide, um, statistically speaking, just general population is just a male wealthy affluent. But in veterans specifically, it's, it's kind of bimodal because we do have the 18 to 45 group. They're the ones who are the most at risk. Um, there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, I couldn't find any reason why they're more at risk than the older veterans, but it is true. Now, just because a veteran who is older does not mean that he is not at risk for suicide because even though a veteran may be older, they are still at double the rate of risk for suicide than the average population. Also, ironically enough, there really is no relationship between combat deployment and suicide. You would think that what you go through over there, what you see over there, now thankfully I never saw anything crazy over there, um, would have a correlation with suicide. But it's not so much the acts themselves that contribute to suicide while you're on deployment, but the stress that comes with going through a workup. Ironically enough, training in the military is a lot more stressful than doing things for real. Um, also, if you are constantly going through this grind where you're away from your family, you're doing this uh, cycle uh, that's months long of training, and then you're deployed for over half a year, which, I mean, it can be, and it's just that. I mean, I had a short deployment of seven months, but there are people in other branches of services that are upwards of a year, 18-month deployments. So that's what really increases the risk for suicide is not so much the what you do on deployment but the the lifestyle that it, it requires to do it successfully and then of course if you're doing this back to back it's it's much higher among uh, people who commit suicide another risk is veterans who are in their first year and those who are dishonorably discharged so dishonorably discharged for those of you who don't know, essentially it's the equivalent of a felony sentence. If you're kicked out of the military and you're given a dishonorable discharge, you have to report that in all your job applications. You get almost no veteran benefits. You have no GI Bill, no education funding, and you probably are not going to get hardly any VA benefits. So it's a pretty black eye, pretty big black eye to come out of service with that. And it, it does increase veteran stress. Also, you if you're in your first year, or you're particularly your first enlistment. So if you're in your first enlistment, 
Uh, I can only speak from the Marine Corps side. You're typically between the ages of 19 to 20, and your coping skills are just not there. This may be the first time you're away from home, and you go through boot camp, and people are yelling at you, and, and you can't cope, or you know, you're doing a job that's stressful out you know, God knows where. And if you don't have those coping skills, it can definitely increase your risk for suicide. So it is quite a, uh, a large issue that not only affects people while they're in, but out as well, and it can follow them. And it's something that the Marine Corps and not just the Marine Corps, but the military in general has struggled with trying to combat successfully. So there are a lot of warnings of suicide. Like I mentioned earlier, there is mental illness, uh, substance abuse. And probably the key one is talking about death and dying, giving away possessions. And then, of course, emotional turmoil. So someone who's suffering from depression, which is not just a bad mood. It's something two weeks or longer that persists in this dour mood. Uh, difficulty sleeping. And then I would say the most important one is that if you ask them, that, that's key. You have to ask for people you suspect of committing suicide, do they have a plan? And if they talk about a plan, well, then that's that's the point of intervention, right? You're, we're talking about hospitalization or um, escorting them to a therapist of some sort. Now, switching from suicide, we're going to talk about obesity. This is a, you know, a condition of the SAD diet, the standard American diet, if you will. And veterans love their food. We are all about the American diet and the American dream of calorie intake. So there are 5 million VA patients. Uh, they did a study of pretty much the whole population of the VA. This was incredible. And they looked through everyone's medical records. And... Essentially, 41% of VA patients are obese and 37% are overweight. That is a staggering statistic. So that means 78%, almost 80% of the people who receive VA healthcare are overweight and not at a healthy body weight at all. And when you compare this to the general population, with only you know 13% being obese and the veterans are rocking a solid high score of 40% or 41%, excuse me, it is a major public health issue. Uh, not just for the VA and the doctors and nurses working there, but for the veterans themselves. Um, the cost of treating an obese patient increases the average cost of care by eight grand. Now, if you extrapolate this among 5 million patients, which this isn't statistically accurate necessarily, it would be $40 billion. But again, not every person comes into the VA constantly. Some patients get seen more than others. So it's not a true figure that I can quote uh, with, a, with a source. But you do see if for all the patients the VA sees on a given day, eight grand, that is quite uh, an increase in cost that can be prevented if people were at healthier weights. So now we've come to basically the so what of the presentation. So these are just some objectives that I have uh, for you, the audience, about what we should be able to take away from this presentation and our discussion. Uh, first of all, we need to be able to recognize and explain the risks of long-term health effects of those three things, suicide, addiction, and obesity, which we've just done. The next two things we're going to cover in the presentation are how to choose and implement strategies to improve these areas of our lives, and also how to recommend and refer other at-risk veterans to programs at the VA or just to implement these strategies in general. So now we've come to tobacco cessation strategies. So um, I come from a family of smokers. Uh, thankfully, the majority of them no longer smoke. And also I have many friends who are trying to quit. And it is by far the hardest thing I've ever seen someone go through to quit. Uh, I've seen friends break free of other types of substance abuse addictions, but cigarettes are probably the one that the majority of them would struggle with anecdotally. So there are a couple of strategies in order to achieve a, a goal of tobacco cessation and probably the most common one is nicotine replacement therapy so this is a nicorette gum patches um, pills you take to essentially give your body lower doses of nicotine where you eventually wean your way off so this does increase your probability of quitting by 50 to 70 percent depending on which method you use um, the really the best thing about nicotine replacement therapy is that if you're a young teenager or more importantly if you're a pregnant woman and you're addicted to smoking cigarettes these are safe to use so if you do happen to have uh, a family member who is with child and they're struggling with nicotine addiction this is a safe alternative to help them not smoke while they're pregnant unfortunately this does lead to higher costs it can be anywhere from thirty dollars to fifty five dollars a week for the gum and the patches depending on which method you use Another method is uh, health coaching. 
So this can be done a variety of different ways, and it can be in clinic or just over a phone. So this uses a lot of techniques. Uh, the biggest ones are emotional interviewing, where they look at what are your triggers for smoking, what makes, how do you feel when you smoke. There's a lot of um, self-reflection and journaling that goes into that. And it does have a two-year cessation rate of 50%. So immediately, um, the rates do increase. So after a period of six weeks, you'll have rates of 80% people are not smoking. And over two years, you still have half the people who have gone through this not smoke. So that may not seem like a lot, but bear in mind that that's two years later. So you can always get back on the train and, and try to regain um, the progress that you made by your previous attempts quitting. The biggest advantage of this is that it's low cost. Um, you, know, you can do this over the phone. It just takes maybe 15 minutes a day, if that, at 15 minutes a week, just to maintain your on track and achieving your goals. Now, the VA has a robust tobacco cessation program. Uh, we've already talked about the amount of money that it costs the VA to treat tobacco-related illnesses, and so as such, they are heavily invested in preventing it. So you can get medication um, from the Department of Affairs. Uh, your VA physician, he can prescribe you nicotine replacement therapy of a variety of sorts and also medication to help curb your nicotine craving. Also, there's counseling in person and over the phone where they talk about a lot of the th same things that the personal coaching does. There's also a lot of tools that are available to you, even if you don't necessarily want to go to the VA to get medication, have a personal counselor. There you can call the smoking quit line, which uh, you know has a 12-hour window, Monday through Friday, or you can do smoke-free vet. So these are just constant reminders or really daily reminders that they will text you for encouragement. So you can set when you want to have, you know, if, if you tend to have your cravings early in the morning, they'll send you texts early in the morning saying, hey, you know, how's it going? Remember to stay the course. Remember, to, you know, remember why you are feeling the way you are and what's making you crave that cigarette. Also, you can get the mobile app, the Stay Quick Coach, which just is essentially a user interface that you can custom design to have your own quit plans. You can journal about how often you're continuing to smoke, what makes you smoke, and pretty much everything that you need all at one stop shop. Now, suicide prevention is definitely something that a lot of people have tried to get right. The probably the most hands-on thing you can do in, in the short term is mitigate those risk factors. And this is most frequently done in terms of an immediate intervention with hospitalization. So I'm not sure on what the code is over here. In California, it's referred to as a 5150 order where a law enforcement can take someone to the hospital who is in a mental health crisis or has a suicidal ideation, and then they can keep them there for a period of usually between 24 to 48 hours, depending on how long the order is. So this is very effective in the short term, not so much in the long term, but it is a, a definitely an intervention that can be used. You can also um, remove access to danger, dangerous items if possible, and you can also, of course, rally that person's support system if there is one. More long-term effects involve mostly psychotherapy, so cognitive behavioral therapy, regular visits to a counselor or therapist. This may involve the prescription of antidepressants and mood stabilizers as well. Thankfully, the VA has a robust system of mental health services, all the way from fully licensed therapists and PhDs to group counselors, and you also have uh, acute mental health uh, inpatient care for seven days and also outpatient care as well. They do also have a lot more long-term centers, so a psychosocial rehabilitation and recovery center. So these are long-term rehab facilities, um, kind of more so your wide variety 12-step programs where they live in a facility, the veterans work together, eat together, and go through their issues with their own personal therapist. So there are currently a variety of these over the country, and right now they house about 22,000 veterans that are going through these programs uh, right now. Moving through weight loss strategies, uh, also a very hard lifestyle uh, component to change. There are a lot of factors that determine our obesity. It's not just our diet. It can be our age, your gender. Men are more prone to obesity uh, prior to menopause, generally around 55 to 60. And then after that, women tend to be more at risk to uh, obesity as well. Uh, your genes play a role in it. Certain uh, racial subgroups are more prone to it than others. It, it just depends. Um, some diet strategies you can do are meal replacement. 
Um, this is highly effective. It may not be the most appealing, but it is actually highly effective statistically speaking. This is where you take a meal and you replace it with an insured drink, a slim fast, or some sort of protein-based uh, drink or beverage that replaces your meal at that point in time. So it is very calorically uh, dense, but it does keep you from having to consume excess calories in the form of a full breakfast or lunch or whatever the case may be. You can also look at your calorie expenditure, which is essentially counting calories, if you will. And you can also have a strong social support, um, not stay out too late. If you do these things and you remain physically active, and more importantly, if you cut out the debilitating stuff, mainly soda or pop if you're from the Midwest like myself, these people who do that are the most successful, statistically speaking, keeping the weight off long term. So that is the hardest part about weight loss strategies is because you have to implement them for a longer period of time and you have to change the way you live your life. So the hard thing about dieting is that you can do it for a period of time and then regain the weight. So it, it, this is recognized by physicians everywhere and typically speaking you are successful in if you only regain 50% of the weight that you originally lost from your diet in, in terms of maintaining your weight successfully. Now, thankfully, the VA does have a lot of weight loss programs uh, for veterans. The most famous one is MOVE, uh, which is just spelled MOVE with an exclamation point. And it is a robust and probably their most famous one. Uh, it includes nutrition components, such as getting classes on what type of foods to choose and incorporate into your diet plan, which type of foods to avoid. And they'll help you customize a nutrition plan based upon uh, you know, your current list of medications that you need to be taking, any type of conditions that you may have, such as diabetes and so forth. Now, the, it does offer group exercise sessions, so if you do live near facilities such as Bay Pines, you can come and you can engage in uh, group exercise workouts with other veterans. Uh, even if you don't necessarily live close to a VA facility, you'll still be able to get all of the components of the MOVE program, and you'll just have to maintain uh, communication with your coach, who will constantly be talking to you and working you through the workout program. It's generally 16 weeks long, and they work with you based on where you're at, where your current fitness level is, and also if you have any current handicaps or physical disabilities, and they create a workout program customizable to you. Also, the people at MOVE are constantly communicating with your primary care physician. So any types of medications that you may need um, to help you lose weight or to help relieve pain from exercising, uh, that would be incorporated into your MOVE plan, and also uh, referrals for bariatric surgery. Unfortunately, not all people can lose weight naturally, um, so that is an option uh, that exists for some veterans that have struggled and have gone through the MOVE program and have not been uh, successful with losing weight through diet and exercise alone. Over on the right, I have a picture of a man named Wilbur Absher. So this is a 70-year-old veteran um, who lost 120 pounds in three years by joining the MOVE program. So he actually did not live near a VA facility and he uh, did most of his coordination with his coach over the phone. And you can see how much weight and just how big of a difference that makes in his general appearance. Um, but also he did this because he had uh, kidney issues and had to get on a kidney transplant list. So as far as I know, this gentleman is still living and he was able to successfully get uh, his kidney. So you can see just how much of a difference that makes in someone's quality of life when they go through these programs and implement them uh, throughout a period of time. Now, locally here at Bay Pines, we have a lot of different departments, um, not only just in terms of healthcare from primary care, emergency, oncology, and so on, but also in the more preventative areas of how we manage our health. So there is diabetes management for those half of veterans that unfortunately do struggle with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, uh, mental health, nutrition and food services. There is a tobacco cessation program, and more importantly, there is a move coordination office. So... I'll give you a couple seconds to write these down. If you have any more questions, you can actually go to the link below. Uh, Bay Pines has a veteran's guide. It's a 60 page document of everything you need to know about the facility, where you can find the cafeteria to who you need to talk to about getting a uh, new set of glasses. So it's, it's quite an extensive uh, document that pretty much walks you through getting the services you need if you qualify for care at Bay Pines. Now, so that's our presentation. Uh, now we're going to move into our discussion prompts. So if you're listening to this, you're obviously not going to be here when I give these discussion prompts, but I would give a period of time uh, to allow people to talk. And we'll move through basically these four things about why do you think veterans are more prone to suicide? 
Uh, do you think there's a stigma being a veteran and struggling with mental health? I can only answer from my experience. So just to give you the idea of how this would go is um, I think it's more so the, the, the mental recombination that goes on through the training. Uh, the majority of your veterans are going to be stable, normal people, but they have been programmed to do a variety of things. And that does leave lasting effects on people more so than the general population who hasn't had that thing, have those things done to them. And it does increase your stress level. Uh, the, I, the amount of stress you have just being in that environment is tenfold over anything I've ever done in the civilian environment uh, by far. And I've worked plenty of dangerous jobs in the civilian environment as well. Um, second prompt, have you ever had success or tried losing weight? And do you think we'd have gotten better results if you had a success coach? This is absolutely true. Um, I have tried, I've struggled with weight even in my short 28 years. I have fluctuated. I'm currently, uh, you know, about, I've lost about 10 pounds and I have 20 more to go. So everyone struggles with weight. It doesn't matter if you're in your prime or if you're getting in towards your twilight years. If I had had a success coach, yes, my, I would have been immensely more successful in, uh, achieving my goals, just having someone to keep me on track um, and be, have that accountability piece would have definitely been a benefit. Uh, have you ever witnessed somebody quitting smoking successfully? Or are you a former smoker? Uh, do you see any strategies that were successful? So I have smoked before, but I would not consider myself a smoker. Um, in the military, it is definitely a cultural thing. There are kids that grew up, uh, you know, straight laced, if you will, uh, did all the right things, went to a great school and decided to join the military, and then they rub shoulders with this culture, and then all of a sudden they're addicted to cigarettes and dip, and they, they look like someone from the hills of uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of Kentucky. So it definitely does, uh, that culture does have, have its effect on some people. Strategies that I've seen were successful, I, I would say it's a combination of all things. The, uh, the Nicorette replacement, no, the Nicorette gum nicotine replacement therapy definitely helps. I've seen a lot of people be successful with that. Unfortunately, it is more expensive, so there's a financial component that goes in with it, but mainly just uh, realizing that it takes external resources to kind of get people through that addiction because it's a rewiring of the brain, and nicotine is such a powerful driver for so many people that it definitely takes a lot of willpower and also external support to help someone come through that. Uh, were there any programs that you learned about today that you would take advantage of for another veteran too? So obviously I knew about these programs when I made the uh, when I made the presentation, but researching them, there were a lot of these I was unaware of. I did not know about Move. I had no idea that it was such this extensive VA program that a lot of people could take advantage of, and I think that's probably the one I would refer the most to because smoking, even though more veterans do it than the, the general population. Obesity is probably the one that affects, the, the, probably the major health issue that affects the most people. So that's the one I would be most likely um, to refer other veterans that I knew to. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, a 55 plus type of person, you know, to struggle with weight. It can be at any age. And I, th I think that's definitely um, just to have that immediate support group uh, to tap into is something that would be beneficial to people and make them more successful in achieving their goals. So this concludes our presentation. Uh, just have a couple slides here for this is where I got my sources and of course either their uh, article reference numbers or the websites I got them from. Uh, I pulled everything from mostly medical research journals but sometimes uh, you know on the ground reporters from NBC and also uh, government data such as from the Center for Disease Control and also the, the VA as well. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me any way you see fit. And again, we'll see how this presentation goes when I give it in person. Thank you.